For this one, I don't have any new scholarly materials to contribute. I just want to show some more images of Sessu landscape paintings and talk about them freely. I'm not even writing out complete notes now. I'm winging it. My eyes are failing. It's hard to read anyway. And it's better to look at paintings than to read texts. That's been a big main contention in my late life. After completing parts A and B in this lecture with uh, relatively coherent arguments, which are intended to contribute to Sestri studies, I received from our old slide room a batch of digitized images from Sestri slides that I'd pulled and forgotten about. So here we go on a rambling account to go with the images, which are the main thing uh, of this third part titled More Sestri Landscapes. First image, please. This is a detail of the long scroll, the Mori scroll, which I showed and talked about in uh, part one, it must have been. And I gave a long story on why I and two others, uh, Rick Vinograd, one of them, failed to see the scroll, a kind of sad story. So that was more a story than a presentation. Uh, if I had a lot of really great slides of it, I could spend a whole lecture on that one, undoubtedly, but I don't have. Next. I do have some good slides of a Four Seasons hand scroll kept in the Kyoto National Museum. I must have made original slides from this and I can show them. So here we go with that. I'm not clear about the seasons. I'll just have to make it up as I go. Lots of things about this lecture are not, are not going to be entirely clear. Uh, at any rate, this would seem to be spring because we see two men seated under blossoming trees over at the middle, just a bit to the right of the middle. Okay, a, a road leads in from the lower part, and another one comes in from over at the left with an overhanging tree. It's a scroll with color done on paper. Uh, quite interesting brushwork and drawing, as we'll see. Uh, next, on to the detail. Here we get in a little bit closer. Yes, uh, there's a kind of a, 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 a whatever, bank sticking out vertical as so often, above the water, and uh, a little tree over at the right, distant hills, and then under the two blossoming trees, two seated figures. Next. And here's a close-up of them. Well, now those of you who have viewed my lectures know very well that, uh, uh, that, uh, that there's a painting very close to this by Ma Yuan in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which I showed at some length. And Seshu may very well have seen a uh, version of this, a copy of it, or perhaps even the original, who knows. And uh, more all but copies it, somewhat pushing the two figures closer together, but uh, essentially the same thing. The two figures that I once described as like a parenthesis enclosing nothing. Okay, very lovely. Lovely painting. Interesting. Brushwork, freer than it would be in China. Loose, but uh, strong. Okay, next. Another section of it. Uh, I'm not sure. It may be summer with a willow tree, willow trees and other, and a kind of other, uh, uh, other tree. And f travelers on the road making their way across the painting. This is, uh, I'm not clear as I say which section this is. Blue color for the water. A fine passage of distance next. And again, going in closer, uh, we see two figures, well, three figures. Uh, a man going ahead who seems to be uh, some kind of a guide, uh, bent over as if he's tired or old or whatever, bearing kind of a hat, and pointing forward. This is something you see in Chinese paintings of just school and other professional schools, sometimes in a gazing at the waterfall picture. One of them is pointing as though saying, hey, there's the waterfall. Anyway, here he's saying, okay, the, uh, our destination is just up ahead here. And behind comes the traveler, the um, uh, higher class person on the donkey, and the servant carrying the luggage. And here, close up next, is there a detail of that, still closer up. Sestri, as I say, has is, is mastered these techniques uh, of just go, some professional painting. He paints the water very capably the, with its ripples going around. Anyway, lovely painting. Next. 
a section of another another part of it, and I'm not clear what the season is. Um, all this rushing water coming down from uh, uh, the far left is, uh, would seem to indicate spring when ice is uh, melting in the mountains and the streams come rushing down. But we've already seen a spring landscape, so I don't know. Anyway, whatever. And uh, here the old man, followed by his servant, is going over a stone bridge over the water. The treatment of, of the middle distance is quite uh, wonderful. They, again, like Song painting, Seshu has mastered so much of that. This uh, fog with the trees just very visible, just above. And then in the upper right of this detail, what is the top of a tingza or rest shoulder? Presumably he's on his way there to sit down and rest and gaze at the scenery. Next, please. This is the first section. No, it's more, well, it's about half of, more than half of the whole scroll, I think, of a small landscape hand scroll uh, uh, dated 1474, painted in ink on paper in the Tokyo National Museum. And of this, I do have good slides, which I partly made myself and others, I guess, I took from reproductions. Anyway, as you see here, uh, it opens with a seal. I'm not sure whether that's Seshu's or what. Then two figures seated on the ground facing each other, like the two we just looked at. Now, this is an original side. It has those uh, stains, brown <laughs> things that tell you this is the real thing, like scratches on old records. Now, and the two figures just seated on the ground talking with each other. That's a symbol of conversation and of communion. Very important for literati, but also for all these artists who are, who are reflecting literati ideals more than literati painting does. A, well, a matter that I discussed in my book on poetic painting. And in the distance houses and leafy trees, more Xiao Gui this time than Ma Yuan. Next, houses, thatched houses, and um, boats down below, or a boat moored, a fishing boat probably, and leafy trees in the mist, very fine Xiao Gui style. And then uh, a bridge going across the stream and uh, houses among trees in the far distance, and an old man bent over with a staff making his way over the bridge, and a boat sailing down below. Here's a, here's a detail. And again, we can see how, how well Seshu handles the, the brush. We don't talk about brushwork as such in painting of this kind, and yet it's really quite fine. Notice, for instance, how the a closer edge of the bridge is done with strokes that don't, diagonal strokes that don't quite connect to suggest the rough construction of it, of diagonally laid planks uh, across a, a framework to, anyway, make, make the bridge. And as I say, the very fine handling of ink values to take you from the nearer rocks to the further it, on the left side, and so on. And on the boat down below, a single figure a fisherman, I guess, way at the back. And here, oh, that's interesting. This is a, a close-up. Um, a, a, a close oh, if you see the, the trees in the far upper left of the long section, uh, the distant trees, some, for some reason I made the detail of the distant trees rising above the ridge or whatever with boulders, and uh, just, to, just to show how Seshu uses the brush for distant foliage. And here is the ending. Uh, well, the, you know, the section I just showed, really. But then it kind of trails off, or at any rate, uh, has, has no writing or anything else to indicate the end. Quite an interesting and fine painting. He was really good at, he re had really mastered a lot of these techniques that uh, were disappearing, shall we say, in China. Okay, the next. Oh, this is, this is must be from another from another hand scroll that is loosely copied after the great Xiaogui, pure and remote view. The one that has the great cliff, because uh, we see the great cliff itself at the left, following on as usual a kind of quiet passage of river with uh, sailing ships. Here, more distant passage than usual. But at any rate, that hand scroll, or rather many copies of it, were well known to. Uh, artists, and knew many of them still survive, and this great cliff keeps turning up over and over. This is, according to the label on the slide, uh, copied after somebody, uh, Gumpo Sagon, a book by that name. 
but I don't know anything more about it than that. Next. And here is a, a landscape with boats and an inlet, horizontal picture, and I can't say any more about it than that. These are all, as I say, made images made from slides in our collection, and the slide labels have very limited information. But notice here how he handles this receding shoreline with a few boats on it, a very dim into the far distance. That's taken from Xiaogui, whereas the mountains are more Kalkagong, sort of triangular. Anyway, very interesting painting. And his signature up at the, uh, up at the upper left. Next. This is a so-called after Seshu, labeled so, which must mean it's copy, I'm not clear. It's a landscape more or less in the Gaokugong manner with these pointy topped or rather triangular topped hills and then a pavilion which indicates the temple and ink on paper. I don't know much of anything about it, I simply show it. Next, please. Here's a uh, haboku landscape, splashed ink landscape, the kind that Seshu became really a master of. Some of his most famous works are in this manner. Uh, I have this plus a detail and I don't know where it is. It may be questionable as a work of Seshu. It doesn't look like his brushwork, but it's interesting anyway. Um, and now here is the, de the close-up detail. Yes, not really much to be seen in it. Two tiny people down at the bottom on a little spit of land sticking out from the shore with some kind of pole next to them. But the brushwork, as I say, is kind of rough and impulsive and not, not exactly sestrues. And the middle distance with what are supposed to be trees doesn't look quite right. Anyway, okay, next. Here, on the other hand, is another haboku landscape, splash tank landscape, which seems perfectly fine. This one has an inscription by Jonon Eitetsu, who died in 1507. So this uh, supplies a what's called a terminus antiquem. In other words, it can't be later than that, or it wouldn't be inscribed by the person who died in that year. Okay, and it's, it's um, a landscape of the type that we've seen now several versions of in the previous lecture. That is a shore with trees, some sticking up, and maybe a building, and then a boat offshore. And this combination, Sashu seems to have done a number of times. This is a fine example, not as famous as the one in the Tokyo National Museum, which I showed at length. Notice the broad brush painting. I think I showed this one before, how he uses the single brush stroke, uh, moving it up and down, broad, broad brush, broken stroke with white in it to do the main shoreline in the center of the painting. Okay, now next. Ah, these two together. These are not paintings, these are photographs. These are two boys or two young men, uh, each of them holding a dog, maybe the same dog. The one on the left is Benedict Cahill. The one on the left, on the right, is Julian Cahill. And I put them on because one of them owns now the paintings that I'm going to show next. Uh, some months ago, when they were down here in Berkeley, uh, I showed them a lot of what remained, in fact, all that remained of my painting collection, and uh, let them uh, what, make notes and make photographs. And then later they flipped coins and chose, and they each ended up with half the uh, paintings. So, as it happened, Benedict, the one on the left, is the one who got the uh, Haboku landscape paintings by Seshu, which we're going to see next. Okay, now, ha, ha I leave them reluctantly, uh, dear people, and go on to next, please. Here is one of the two paintings. Now, uh, these are pretty important. They're in the Berkeley Art Museum, on long-term loan, presumably, and uh, they're signed works of Seshu with seals. I, I bought them from a dealer in Tokyo. Uh, it was after a great Seshu exhibition. And in fact, the, the person who wrote a long essay on that told about how he recognized genuine Seshu paintings from certain characteristics of the uh, signature and seal and so on. And I brought him these and showed them and said, here, they, they match perfectly in the signature and seal and as and well as in brushwork. How about it? Well, he was very... He hemmed and hawed and said, well, we can't be that positive. No Japanese would like to accept new Seshu paintings without a lot of fight. These are, I think, perfectly fine, genuine Seshu uh, Habuku paintings. Now in our Berkeley Art Museum, as I say, and owned by Benedict Cahill. They're not well preserved. The other one's especially badly preserved. 
But as you see, we have the same elements, essentially. Over uh, Reading it from the left, let's say, the two men in a boat, seen very clear, a slight indication of a distant shoreline, and a brushstroke, which is very much like the one we've seen in others, big broad brush, broken, uh, forming a kind of uh, what, uh, knoll or whatever of earth, and then uh, pushing off to the right and ending in streaks, and then rising above that, this uh, hill overlooking the water, which is there in most of Sessu's paintings, with a pagoda, which indicates, a, of course, a uh, temple, and trees, and really, really quite fine. Okay, I've talked enough about that. Now let's go on to see details of it. Now, of course, the, the classical example to which this can be compared is this fan-shaped painting by Sestru after Yu Zhen, the late Song Chan master Yu Zhen, which he copied, in a sense, freely while he was in China or after he came back, whatever, uh, with some of the same materials, as you see, the distant shore of the boat, the uh, broad brush strokes for the main base, and uh, uh, in this case, tree and houses and so on. At any rate, there are a number of Seshu Habuku landscapes of this kind. He probably did them over and over for whatever reason, for, for practice or for, for different people. The, okay, next. Here's the um, Benedict's painting up, up close, the detail of it. And the brushwork is really, in its way, quite fine and, I think, convincing. The condition of these is bad, and that's part of the reason I was able to buy them without spending a huge amount of money. Also, they hadn't been recognized in Japan, but I think that's true of quite a number of paintings, so we say. Okay, next. And here is the uh, other part of it. Uh, all the paper is, partly it's the paper that is, uh, what, uh, old and stained and so forth, but partly something is wrong with the photograph. It shouldn't be so much as this. And the people, anyway, in the boat to the far left, and the broad stroke that makes the shoreline and up then the pagoda up above. Okay, next. And the other one, this is really a mess, the other one is a winter landscape with trees on the shore. We've seen something like it in previous lectures. That is a big uh, mass of rocks or earth mass or whatever it may be, masses of earth, and a tree growing out of them, an old tree, and then in the, uh, far, in, the dis in the distance, up at the left, tops of houses, giving a certain space to the scene. Well, we've seen several of those. One of them in that landscape album that we considered at great length. And again, there is Seshru's signature and seal off on the left. Next. And here is uh, a close-up of that. Well, again, I won't uh, spend a lot of time on it, but to me it looks quite convincing, and I think that Seshru scholars should begin paying a bit of attention to this, and maybe even including them in uh, Sessu exhibitions is at least fairly plausible works. Okay, next. Here is still another Haboku landscape by Sessu. I'm not sure where this one is. No, I don't have any notes on it, really, but very much the same things, with a rather more strongly shaped landscape mass going from a foreground or a close-up uh, foreground, and then gradually going up the ridge with some trees to a peak at the top. Uh, houses and some kind of pole with a, something on it up the left, and in the front, as usual, a fisherman, uh, or a rather horizontal fishing boat, and a signature down on the lower right. And here is the detail from it. This one is especially rough. Probably that, that doesn't necessarily disqualify it. It may be a little bit too fluid or not quite defining enough. Now that I look at it, it, it makes the whole painting look a little bit suspicious. Maybe this is not nearly as likely as the pair that I've just shown of my own. And here, let's see, what is this now? This is a, oh, this is a, another detail, I guess. Uh, oh, rather, rather loose. Okay, and the man, oh, the man in the boat in the front. Now then, here are four details. I didn't make the pictures myself. They must be from reproductions of uh, four paintings titled Kin Ki Shoga, which is Japanese for chin or the zither, uh, chi or for wei chi, the board game wei chi. Uh, sho is, of course, uh, uh, calligraphy, and ga, hua, uh, painting. So these are the four elegant accomplishments, uh, playing the chin, playing wei chi, 
uh, doing calligraphy and doing painting. And this is how scholar gentlemen are supposed to spend their spare time uh, when they're living in retirement or whatever. And here, in one of them, we see a standard Maoyuan type landscape painted by Sestru, in which the two men with their little boy servant are seated on the usual ledge by the water with a tree hang overhanging them and uh, powerful rocks all around them. And one of them is uh, they're facing in the usual way, one in, one out, and um, the, one of them is playing the chin for the other. And we have to imagine, as I've said many times, we imagine the sound of the chin, very quiet, very lovely, somehow blending with the sound of the running water near them, with the sound of the wind in the tree, and other natural sounds. So he is somehow like, becoming almost like a sound of nature. Okay, that's what the chin was all about. Okay, this, the next one. This is obviously Chi or Wei Chi, and the two men are seated at a board on a stone platform out in nature near a thatched house, which we see over the top of over at the right. Uh, it's a kind of garden you can see because there's a railing in the sort of to the left of center, and also a table with a, a pot with flowers or branches in it and so on, and a couple of servants, uh, one of them down at the right, uh, getting more wine to serve to them, another one standing waiting over at the right, and then far distance, very much, as I say, Mayuran style. I'm not sure where these paintings are or much about them. I'm just showing them. Yeah, here, here, this must be the scholar gazing into the sort of sitting back, resting from doing calligraphy, I suppose. He has a table and a stone table in front of him, and the houses that he came from, the thatched roofs are down on the left. So he's come out to walk up onto this ledge and sit at his table and uh, listen to the wind in the pines and do calligraphy. That is the way I'm reading this painting anyway, while his boy stands beside him. And then the winter scene must be ga or hua or painting. And indeed, if you look closely, you can make the uh, interior of the house at the left out and see a uh, a table and uh, probably someone sitting at it with paint with uh, stuff uh, uh, spread out in front of him. It's a little hard to read, at least for me. I can see a low table in the distance zone. Anyway, it's a winter scene with a old plum tree waiting to burst into blossom again when spring comes, etc. So for quite conventional but lovely uh, kinky shoga paintings. Now then, now I'm going to show various landscape hanging scrolls, partly to explore some more their construction and something about their subject matter. Well, this is all very conventional. We've done it already, but no reason not to go on doing it. Okay, here's a tall one. A lot of all these, as I say, are from slides, and a lot of them I don't know from the originals. Okay, here is one, let's see, yes, one that has in it um, a... Uh, if we look here, that, that's the whole thing with the inscriptions up at the top. The artist would sometimes, or later owners sometimes, would invite people to write inscriptions on them. And these inscriptions sometimes help to, uh, to date the painting, but they're liable to be, of course, later than the painting. And sometimes they're even on separate paper. Anyway, that's a long subject. Um, and Sessu's signature and seal. Here's the close-up. Now, uh, as you see, the, what, what is happening is that a road comes in from the bottom, I mean a path, whatever you want to call it, and uh, zigzags back through the rocky landscape, and you see the old scholar and his boy servant, as usual, making their way along this, and they're making their way to a temple. And the temple is um, the place where they will rest and maybe uh, be put up and eat their dinner and drink and talk with the monks and all the rest of it, and then they'll proceed on their way. Well, you can see that there's a kind of a side path that goes off to the left from the temple behind that huge rock with trees on it, and it ends at a little tingza that, uh, where you're supposed to sit and gaze out over the water, and there you see boats in the distance and so on. Well, of course, this is the theme of uh, arriving at the temple and leave, leaving the temple the next day. I could show, and I will put beside this, a number of examples which you will remember. 
Here's one by Seshu himself from the album that was the main subject of part two of my Seshu lecture. Uh, in this case, the old scholar is leaving the temple down on the lower left, gazing back at it, followed by his servant, and the road to the temple, which comes in from the right and zigzags back, and then you see the temple under the cliff. This is very much in a mm, Li Tong style, uh, from the texture strokes on the rocks and the construction of the rock and the construction of the whole scene. Uh, next, please. Here's an album leaf by a unknown Southern Song artist named Wu Shu Ming in Japan, a fan painting uh, which I showed in talking about the followers of Li Tong. And indeed, it has lots of Li Tong characteristics, the pine tree and fir tree, the tall, uh, vertical, uh, distant peaks, and uh, the texturing and, and the light and shadow on the rocks. And the narrative is indeed here, uh, two people arriving at the temple. And as I was talking about, one of them is sort of turning back to the other one and pointing ahead, saying, look, we're coming there, we're about to get there. And then uh, they, they zigzag and we see the temple beyond the rocks and under the pines. And then if we look closely up in the upper right, we can see the road by which they will continue their journey after stopping at the temple. The temple, in other words, is not only a kind of, uh, a kind of ob objective, although the seeking enlightenment uh, what theme of early landscape is somehow still echoed a little bit here, but it's also a stopping place where you uh, where you uh, lodge before before going on. Okay, next, and then uh, uh, this going still back further. This is the painting by probably by Ma Yuan, which uh, didn't come in the. Uh, Metropolitan Exhibition because the condition wasn't good, but which I reproduced in my essay for the catalog of that and discussed at some length. It's in the Palace Museum in Taipei. A kind of, not exactly large album leaf, but anyway, uh, it's not signed by Xiao Gui, but the attribution is made by a late Ming calligrapher in the upper right. And here you see a boat down at the bottom and a traveler arriving in the lower left. It's a winter scene and there are uh, there's a kind of an inn or cluster of houses with tall bamboo down in the bottom. And then the road goes up and goes up, and you eventually, after passing a bridge, a kind of covered bridge over the ravine, you arrive at the temple in the ravine in the, in the middle left. And then afterwards, the road goes on from that. You see that white streak that goes around the cliff. So this is uh, an early version of exactly that theme, which we find, as I say, over and over again. And now we see it over and over in Seshu. These are, these themes is not that they become boring because they're done over and over, but all the more interesting because they are, they show how different artists are able to create new uh, what, versions of, of these themes. Okay, now, so here we go to Wushu Ming Shagwe. This is a landscape I don't know about in Hyogo Prefectural Museum, I guess, which is a uh, the, the little a boat uh, moored down on the thing, and then and then the figure uh, getting getting off the man and his servant, and the stri and the uh, thing leading back into the uh, to the temple. First, you have what seems to be a an outbuildings or secular or whatever. You now here's the, okay. Here it is in closer up. And then way up in the upper right, distantly, the temple buildings. So these are all part, uh, part of the same temple complex, presumably. And that's their, their destination. Now, I, now that I see it, it's, it looks more like a fisherman with a, stab, with a fishing pole over his shoulder. Anyway, it's the same kind of theme and the Seshu signature. Okay, here, close up. Yes, here we go. Yes, it's uh, no, it's, it looks like a man with some kind of luggage over his shoulder, and um, heavy rocks and so forth, Maoyuan style rocks. All right, next. Uh, this is one which um, is landscape ins inscribed by Ryozen, is the label on the slide. Um, same subject, roughly. Uh, the arrival, the signature is in the lower right, a boat with people in it, a path going back, 
and up the mountain to where the temple must be. I can't quickly see it anyway. All right, now I want to turn to look at some Seshu screens, uh, basically to see the same subject. This one, for instance, famous Seshu screen. There is a kind of, uh, what would you call it, village in the middle foreground with houses and figures. It's our uh, everyday life scene and leafy trees. And then, then a road going back, one that sort of comes in at the far left, but then a road going back from the center onward, going into the far distance. And presumably there's going to be a temple back there. I can't quickly see it. Let's see if I have details. Yes, here we go. Uh, yes, okay, here, here's a road going back. A detail from that. And three little figures in the lower part. Uh, looks like two men and their servant and some thatched houses. And um, here we follow the road up and up and up and we pass a Tingza rest shelter where they can stop for a while and rest. And then way up in the upper middle, we see two pagodas, which must mean here is the temple that is their objective. I prepared a lecture on paintings by post-sung artists, uh, which I will have in this series. Uh, post-sung artists who follow the conventions of sung professional uh, and academy uh, painters in slightly later times. And we find these same elements in one after another. In other words, a certain program was expected in paintings of this kind. It wasn't boring, it was interesting. What is the artist going to do with this? It's no more boring than, I don't know, you have an exhibition of religious paintings from the Renaissance, the Madonna and Child and others, and St. John, and nobody is going to say, boring, boring, because it's all the same subject. Um, it's not what we're looking at. Okay, at any rate, uh, there's lots of room for innovation that is within these uh, within these things. Now then, going on. Oh, here's the distance in that same uh, in that same picture. As you move off to the right on the screens, then you see the distance with sailing boats and so on. Now let's go on. Here is uh, another pair of screens with very much the same subject. I haven't really much that's new to say in it. Okay, and uh, one can read them the same way with far distance and uh, houses with ordinary people and then going on to the temple. Uh, here next. Okay, here is a detail from it. Yes, the houses down on the lower right. People ascending out in the courtyard, thatched houses, leafy trees, Shagwe style, and way up at the top of the center is the, their destination, the temple. Uh, here, coming closer in, oh yeah, we see a passage uh, on the way up where the two, uh, two people have stopped to talk to each other, and we have these two in their conventional pose, seated and facing each other, meaning conversation, Shagwe style. Okay, and even, I, I bring back from the previous lecture this fan painting next, uh, which is, uh, according to his own inscription, it's after Xiaogui. And here we see the old scholar and his servant in the lower right coming into the picture and the zigzag path going back in an area of mist and a huge boulder. And we have to assume that the path continues through that and eventually up there in the upper right is indeed the temple that is their destination. So as I say, a very conventional, very common theme. Um, but while we're looking at fan paintings, I'll show several more. Here is a fan painting showing a boy on a water buffalo, a herd boy, and the calf coming along behind in a landscape. Uh, this one he uh, inscribes in the lower right is after Li Tang. He writes the name of the original artist uh, down in the corner, that is, to indicate where the composition came from. And then he writes his own signature on the painting. It's a work of Seshu after Li Tong is what he means. And indeed, one can find Li Tong features in it. Here is another one. Oh my, this is, uh, oh, oh, this is, oh, this is another reproduction of the same, but a terrible reproduction. Uh, there was a time when we had to put up with color reproductions that were made by a very skillful woodblock printing published in Kokka magazine and elsewhere. They were great woodblocks, but they were bad, bad reproductions because they had to clean everything up and smooth everything out and you lost just about everything that was interesting in the picture. So, okay, I'd, I won't leave that on for a long time. Here's a, another uh, Seshu after Li Tong, same, in which there are two 
buffalo, or a buffalo and a calf, I guess it is, is that right? Anyway, an old man who seems to be teaching the younger man, both of them wearing broad hats, and ashore with tall bamboo stretching out and leaning over them and somehow echoing the shape of the fan. Very fine. Okay, now then, where do we go to? Four Seasons Landscapes. Okay, I've got a whole bunch of pictures of hanging scrolls from sets of four hanging scrolls, each of them representing one season. These were very common and very popular, uh, done by artists of the Jo School, uh, professional artists who followed the Sung Academy tradition somewhat. People like to change them in their, wherever they hung the paintings. In Japan, it would be the Tokonoma. In China, it was mm, guest rooms. It was entry halls. It was all over. And change them according to the season. And um, so they, they were, anyway, very popular. Uh, I have a series of these all mixed up. They can generally be dated by various criteria, dated within Seshu's oeuvre or his career. And the Japanese scholars have done all these things. These are all the things that I am not doing, not trying to do uh, in uh, this lecture. I'm just talking about the pictures. It would be an enormous job and not one that I'm equipped to do anymore to look up all the references and try to find why these paintings can be dated to such and such within Seshu's career. Anyway, this is a uh, seasonal landscape. I can't even tell you what the season. A moored boat, uh, houses, leafy trees, summer maybe. Okay, and here is the Seshu signature for it. Well, that would interest scholars if you were working on questions of authenticity and so on. Here, oh, it's a summer landscape, okay. And here is the, oh yeah, here's a close-up of the detail of the lower left where the old man with a, or the fisherman maybe, with a broad hat is getting out of his boat and so on. Uh, done in a rather broad style. And here are the leafy trees, more like Xiaogui, and various things uh, up above. And here are the distant hills with bands of fog around them. Uh, okay, all very fine. Now the best known of these, and I just put them on to remind you, uh, two, two of each two in the image, are the series that he made sometime after coming back from China, more in the manner of the Zhe School, or the, uh, the uh, Ming Academy artists. Uh, he, he learned from them, but he also learned a lot from Sung painting that differs from, goes beyond, who knows what, uh, somehow is different from what you find in Ming painting. Seshu, in other words, I used to uh, speak of him, him as a fine Ming painter, but I don't do that anymore. He's much more than that, much more interesting than that. Okay, here are next. Here is the summer landscape of that, I think it is, which um, uh, in, in a better slide. And here we see, in other words, they're down at the bottom, the thatched house with a flag hanging out from it, which means in wine shop, place to stop. And then a whole uh, cluster of houses among leafy trees. And then there is our temple, and then up above the great, uh, whatever, peak, not exactly a peak, big knobby thing rising up above them. All right, very common. And here is the winter landscape with a, a man coming in under an umbrella in the lower left over a bridge and uh, a place to stop and the village and where he's going to be and then must be a temple way up in the, in the ravine there, and kind of old Fan Quan like dotting at the top. Okay, all very familiar. Now, going on with Four Seasons Landscapes. This is, oh, what is it indeed? Maybe it's summer, I don't know. Okay, here are two boats drawn up on the shore, leafy tree, no, it's just more autumn maybe, with autumn trees, and, uh, and the temple in the upper right. Well, if I haven't anything to say, I won't spend a lot of time on these. Still another one from another series, uh, a, uh, a little house down here. Looks like you can look into the inside uh, where you can enjoy um, uh, maybe getting something to eat and drink and so on. And then you make your way up to the temple and the scene through the ravine. All right, and here is still another one. In this one, the building, the major building is down on the shore, uh, out going out into the water, a kind of waterside pavilion and boats, and then uh, houses in further in, 
uh, the, the person who owns that, presumably. And then the path going up, and a man seated on a wedge further up, gazing at the waterfall, another very common theme in Ming painting. Uh, and here is the winter landscape in that series. And this one's that happens, I've got a number of details of, so I'll just show those. And that will finish our talk of the, uh, of the Four Seasons paintings. All white from snow, black and white, uh, no leafy trees. Uh, here's the signature, again, of interest only to Seshu scholars here. For me, it's just here. It is Seshu signing it again, as usual. Okay, here's the upper peak. Um, powerful. Uh, you could make it out of clay if you wanted to. In other words, it's well shaped. The shading plus the texture strokes, or what's left of texture strokes, still work very well to give this a powerful thrust and a thrust back. And you can sort of see the, uh, the, the way you would climb it if you had to going up. Uh, some trees down at the lower left. Okay, now we're getting toward the end. Here are the, yeah, here's a bunch of, of uh, bare trees down below, uh, indicating the wintry season and a plank bridge going across the stream in the lower left and the thatched roofs of houses in the lower right. Okay, the usual elements. And here, another detail, here's a man uh, with sort of shaky looking legs making his way under a broad umbrella to keep the snow off of him up on his way into the village or onto the temple, whatever. Okay, now I'm going to finish then by bringing back for a bit, the great painting of by Seshu of Amano Hashidate in a place, uh, Miyazu, is it? Yes, if Miyazu, uh, up above to the north of Kyoto. And I gave, I talked about it at the end of my lecture, talked about it at some length, and how a group of us led by Tsuji Nobuo, Tsuji Sensei, went there and stayed there and so on. Okay, I won't repeat all that, but here is a better picture than I showed then of Seshu's great painting. And here's a detail from it with the shoreline with buildings. Now this is a painting based on real observation, not uh, conventions, not something inherited from China. Uh, he uses features of style uh, and brushwork and forms and all that he inherited from Chinese painting to be sure. But I made the argument, which is not peculiar to me, that in a painting like this, Seshu is moving into a more specifically Japanese style. And that's a pretty complicated matter that I tried to deal with in the other lectures. At any rate, there are, um, what, houses clustered along the shore and maybe a temple and the, yeah, there's, you know, it's just a Shinto shrine. You can see the Torii Gate, very small, in front of that dark hill in the middle. And uh, then he identifies the places. There's one such inscription. Side. Now, if, if there's anything that he was basing it on, next please, it would be something like this. This is a detail from the scroll representing the West Lake near Hangzhou, uh, attributed to Li Sung, and uh, a Southern Sung Academy master. And I showed it in one of my Lecture 12s. Uh, uh, and uh, I have a whole series of details of this, a favorite scroll of mine particularly wonderfully visual and so on. Well, Seshu may indeed have seen something like this or topographical paintings, I, uh, we've called them, that is paintings representing real places. And he brings back this practice to Japan. Now, uh, Seshu may, in other words, have seen things like this when he was in China. And here's another detail from the Seshu's uh, uh, Amano Hashidate painting with uh, the Torii Gate, which I saw very small before, and leading into a shrine, and then a village, and uh, temple roofs, and all the rest of it all around, and a road going way, way up to up the hill, and labels, and so on. Quite a wonderful painting, a great painting, one can say. All right, next. Now, did Seshu do paintings while he was in China, paintings of real places there? Question mark. Now, I don't know of any extant paintings that would prove, that would give us a yes answer to that. However, I do know, and it may be that we even have in our museum, I'm not sure, uh, a shukuzu or a reduced-sized copy 
of a Sestru painting made by a uh, Kano school artist, later a Japanese artist, later than Sestru, representing the West Lake uh, at uh, Hangzhou and uh, with a lot of familiar things in it, the various buildings and boats on the thing and the, and the bridges with arches and all the rest of it. So if this is based on a real Sestru, uh, as it claims in the inscription on it, this, and it looks as quite plausible as that, then there must have been a Sestru painting like this done while he was in China, perhaps really at the West Lake. Now here's a detail. And up top, it, uh, here's write, uh, writing which says in Japanese, Hangzhou, Shihu, uh, West Lake picture. He is at a lodge in Beijing, uh, Tungguan anyway. He did this picture, Banhua, something about, no, ban, oh, no, no, it was something about the year. Okay, but I think we may have this in our museum. I bought several of these shukuzu ours in Japan for study. And uh, here is a peak with a temple the non-koji uh, on, on it. Next, please. Here's another section, uh, the, the north uh, koji, hokoku koji, and various other temples and so on down below. Uh, and this is, as I say, what the Japanese call shukuzu, a reduced-sized copy of a kind that was made by, uh, by Japanese artists, well, particularly the Kano school. If you brought them a painting to show them, if you brought a painting to a what's called a conte ka, that is a professional connoisseur, to do the connoisseurship on the painting you owned, he would look at the painting for you. He would make a copy of it to keep, shukuzu, and then if he had positive things to say about it, uh, he would write them on the box, typically. The Japanese did that instead of colophones, so the Chinese would mount separately from the painting above it or after it or sometimes actually inscribe their inscriptions on the painting. This is another difference between the two cultures. So this is such a uh, shukuzu made by some later artist who saw the real uh, seshu painting was able to make this reduced size copy from it. So okay, this suggests that seshu really did paint a real place in China, and he may have done other such, and it's valuable evidence and so I did end up giving some little bit of scholarly value to this, uh, to this long addendum. Uh, and, but here, here it ends, the addendum to the two-part lecture called Seshu and Chinese Painting, uh, done by your old Seshu admirer, James Cahill. The end.